Luke chapter 16 and verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass, and the beggar died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. I will for just a few moments this morning. You've read the scripture text that Jesus Christ gave us, Luke chapter number 16, about a man that died and went to hell. Now I want you to think with me for just a little while about if someone were to die, in today a lot of them are going to die. Every five minutes I do not know how many thousand leave this world to go out to meet God. But when they die, and the soul leaves this body, they either die to go be with Jesus, or they die and they go to hell. And when this man died, he went to hell. The Bible said Abraham died and lifted up his eyes with Abraham in his bosom. But the rich man died and he lifted up his eyes in hell. The Bible has some definitions about hell. We are not left at a loss as to what the place looks like. The Lord has told us quite a bit about it. As a matter of fact, most of the messages that he preached were on hell. He preached a great deal about hell. And I heard a man yesterday morning out here in the parking lot, I was somewhere, and I turned the radio on, and I heard a young man on the radio talking about hell. That was the first message that I had heard on hell on the radio in a long, long time. Not much of it in Knoxville, Tennessee, preaching on hell. But my friend, I believe that's something that we need to hear is about hell. When a man dies and his soul leaves this body, the first thing that strikes him is that he's no longer in the same place that he was. But he realizes that he starts falling into a pit. The Bible said that hell is a place of a bottomless pit. It is a place where this individual starts falling, falling, falling. The greatest sensation he realizes is that head over heels he's falling, falling, falling down into a pit. He's going further and further and further away from any love, from any peace, from any joy, from any rest, from anything that anyone would ever want. This man is going further and further and further away, and he keeps falling and falling and falling. You see, he's died, and it's too late for him. Once an individual dies without God, my friend, you can't pray over their body. It's too late. There's not a thing you can do for them. They're gone, and he falls, and he continues to fall. But beneath him, hell opens its mouth, and beneath him, the screams and the wailing of the damned are coming up into his ears. He realizes that beneath him, is another world, a world that he's never seen before, a world that he's had no part in, a world that he doesn't want any part of, but it's something he has no control over whatsoever. He's going down now, and his soul is being carried ever so swiftly down into the pit, and he continues to fall. The screams are reaching his ears, and the smell, and the, the screams are the smell of that that's coming up out of the pit of the dam. He smells it, and he hears it, and there's no doubt in his mind what lies beneath him. He knows that he's going there, and he can't stop it, and he continues to fall. And the heat now, not only do the screams rise up into his ears, not only does he smell the smell of the stench of the decaying matter beneath him and the smell of hell, but my friend, the heat begins to rise up and engulf him. And he realizes that the deeper he falls into this pit, that the hotter it gets. And down he goes, deeper and deeper and deeper into the pit. The screams are growing louder, and the heat is hotter. Why? Because he's falling, my friend, into a pit. And the pit in the Bible is described as hell. So down he goes, and he can't stop himself. Maybe he claws at the sides. Maybe he does everything he can to try to stop this terrible plight that he's about to enter into. But I'm afraid it's too late. 
It's too late when you die, my friend. It's entirely too late. And down he goes, ever further, into the pit. Now the heat is unbearable. The heat has surrounded his body. And there, everywhere he turns, there's no peace. There's no way to get out of this searching, this searing pain that's cutting at him all around. He screams and he begs and he pleads, but it does him no good. There's no ear for his plea to fall upon. Nobody loves you in hell. Nobody's concerned about your suffering in hell. Nobody wants to hear about your plight when you go to hell. They're crying too, and they're weeping and they're wailing and they're moaning too. And down he goes. He's clawing and he's scratching and he's gnashing his teeth. He's gnashing his teeth because the pain now is unbearable and there's nowhere to go to. He can't get out of it. There's nothing he can do. And he continues to fall. But he realizes he's not alone. All around him are others that have gone on before him into the pit, into the terrible place called hell. And there they are weeping and they're wailing and they're gnashing their teeth and they're screaming. And some of them are screaming and praying and screaming and praying and praying and screaming, but it does them no good. Maybe all over the place you can hear the voices of people as they repent and they cry out to God from the depths of hell and they say, God, God, please, if there's just one slight chance that I might be saved, please hear me now. I want out of this terrible place. But the sound of the dam that goes off of the walls of hell and it doesn't reach any higher to the ears of God. He has closed the pit of hell and there are no sounds of mercy arising out of that terrible sinking place. There is no mercy in hell. There's no peace in hell. There's no rest in hell. It's nothing but weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in hell. And down he goes and he continues to fall. And now there are those around him that are gnashing upon him and they're crying and they're screaming and they're tearing at him and he fights to get away from them and they fight to get away from him because he's screaming and gnashing it's nothing but a mad house like a pack of dogs as they tear one dog apart in the midst of them that's all it is in hell you say when I get to hell I'll have a big time with my crowd those that I've enjoyed my drunken party with here upon the earth no my friend you'll scream when you get to hell with them just like they scream and I want you to know that I, my God is love the Bible said he's love and the Bible said if you don't love your brother then you don't know God and I know that but I also know that his love comes to the pit of hell. And once that door is stopped, the love of God will not open that pit up again and go on down beneath it because he stays his hand and you continue to fall. You can't imagine how hot it would be. You say to yourself, I don't see it. I can't understand. You say to yourself, how could God be merciful? How could God be a just God and allow someone to go to hell? God Almighty is an all-knowing God. He knows everything there is to know. He brought out a good point a moment ago about that aircraft that crashed. It crashed because every soul was on that plane that God had brought together that day to go down for it to be the last day that they'd ever lived upon planet Earth. Every one of them are dead. And tomorrow or the next day, there's going to be about 150 new made graves scattered out all over this country from those that died. And out of that 150 that died, how many of them went to hell? How many of them just like that went down into the pit and have been falling ever since then? Can you see the man as he reaches up, as he tries to cling to the sides and he looks up and he's going down and he wants out of the pit, but there's no getting out of the pit. Once you go to hell, friend, there you'll stay forevermore. And down you continue to fall. The heat is terrible. You're gnashing your teeth. And all the memories as they flash through your mind of every opportunity you ever had to get saved, of that preacher you made fun of there that gave you a track and tried to tell you about Jesus, of the preacher that witnessed to you there in the church in the altar one day, but you wouldn't listen to him and you wouldn't get saved, of the times when you were a child that mama told you about Jesus, Jesus, and you said you didn't need him for just a little while longer. Let me live out my teenage years and have a big time and run with the boys and girls. And when I get older, that's for older folks, you say, I'll get saved. And all of those thoughts are running through your mind. And all of that memory begins to haunt you because in vivid three-dimensional color, right before your very eyes, never to be taken away, is the picture, my friend, of those that you love the most 
of that that you miss the most, of that that would bring the greatest agony to your soul, of that that would make you cry the loudest, of that that would hurt you the most. The purpose of hell is to inflict torment. The purpose of hell is for God's justice and retribution to be brought upon a sinner. And there, my friend, it will not be loosed. It's upon you forever. Down you go. No hope. You've cried a thousand times. You've screamed till you can scream no more. You've begged and you've pleaded. You've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed. I'll tell you if you want to have a prayer meeting, you open the pit of hell and you listen to the souls that have gone on that know not God, but let them have five minutes in this altar this morning to get saved. I'll guarantee you we would sing no more invitation hymns. They'd come running to the altar and upon their face they'd meet their maker. They'd plead for salvation from God and you couldn't hold them back. Nothing would spare them. They'd be saved. But I'm afraid God God doesn't do it that way. For the just shall live by faith. I got saved today. I look back to Calvary at my bleeding, dying Savior. I got saved the day that I asked God to have mercy upon my soul. And since that day, I've never seen Jesus in my natural eye. Oh, but I've heard his voice. I've felt his presence. I've seen his power. And I know he's real. He's in my soul this morning. And he's there forevermore. I am his. And he is my that my friend it's a shame that the one in hell has no mercy and he has no peace but that's not all hell's not the end of it you study your bible you know something worse than that's coming one of these days i mean even though the pit is terrible and the man falls and he falls and he falls and he screams my friend one day as he goes down in that pit head over heels falling I don't know, maybe if he died today, it'd be a thousand and seven years before he heard the call. But I know one thing, I know one thing, that one day the whole chambers of hell will sound with the echo. I know one day that every single soul that has gone on without God will hear the sound as the sound of thunder, as the voice of the Almighty as the power of God, as the one the Bible said in Hebrews 1 that upholds all things by the word of his power. And when the Bible said all things, it means all. It means that hell is fueled by the power of God. It means that as long as God lives, there'll be a hell. And friend, he's not dead and he's not going to die. And I want you to know when the sound comes that the whole chambers of hell will echo and that soul that had been falling will stop falling. And instead of falling, he starts coming up out of the pit. Can't you imagine the day when God reaches down and he opens that terrible lid and all of that stink, all of that screaming, all of the slime, all of the degradation of hell begins to rise up. Can't you see the picture when the day that God opens hell and out they come and listen, friend, that power locks on to that soul in hell and instead of falling, he finds himself rising. He cannot control that any more than he could going down. Listen, once you leave this world, you got no control over what happens to you then. You got every control this morning upon what happens to you. All you got to do is believe in Jesus and be saved. But when you die, you have no say so in the matter. Out you come, up to the top again. You haven't seen sunlight in a foul. If Jesus came, friend, tonight, and you died today, it will be at least a thousand and seven years before this happens. But it'll be the first time in a long time that you've seen any light. But it won't be sunlight that you see that day when that pit opens up and out you come. You're going to come into another world you've never been in before. For all around is nothing but utter bleak black darkness. I mean, when you look out to where Pluto was, there is no Pluto. When you look to the east to where the sun was, there is no sun. When you look to where the planets were, there are none. You see, the Bible said in Revelation chapter number 20 that the heavens and the earth fled away and there was no more place for them. That means that one day God's son going to lift his hand and when he raises it to the point that he calls the power forth, it'll be gone. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it will be gone. It will melt with fervent heat. 
It will be gone. The Bible said the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. What's that for, preacher? Out of all of that, out of the utter blackness of eternity, that's the way it was, you know, before God ever made anything. There was just God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Just the three of them. Before there ever was a cherubim or an angel or a Lucifer, before anything was, there was God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in perfect love and communion among them. But my beloved friend, one day that'll happen again. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the inhabitants of hell coming up and seated in heaven upon a beautiful throne is the darling of my soul, is the Savior of my soul. It's my God and my King. It's my Lord and my Master. It's the Alpha and the Omega. It's the beginning and the end. It's the Word, the Son of Abraham, the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Son of God, seated upon a throne with a vast host of heaven around him. Nothing beneath them, my friend. There is no planet to stand on. There's no air to stand on. Just a throne. And people, 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 as far as your eye can see are people, Beautiful people. You say, how beautiful, preacher. All of them replicas of the one sitting upon the throne. Made alive and made anew in the Son of God. So we shall bear his image. I bear the image of the earthly today. But glory to God, hallelujah, I shall bear his glorious image. There they stand. No old people with hair falling out. And with arthritis in their joints bent over a cane. No more dear old saints lying in bed for 30 or 40 years eaten up with disease, waiting and pleading for the moment that God calls them home. No more cancer to eat away at the body and let the loved one lie in a hospital bed while mama and the rest of them stand around the bed and they weep and they cry and they look up into their eyes and say, Mama, who brought that man into this room? And as you look around the room, maybe one standing there just as beautiful, my friend, as he's always been. Mama, who's that man? I'll tell you what happened when I was a child. My grandfather told me about one of his boys that passed away when he was 12 years old. And my friend, when he passed away at 12 years old, he told them about a man standing in the room with them. And that man was a beautiful, brilliant man of light. He came, what for? Well, he reached in there and he picked up the soul of that little boy. And he just patted him real good and he took him right on up to glory with him. Well, that's the light that I'm talking about this morning. He's the Son of God. And Satan tries to manufacture a false light and appears a false Christ. Power has you. Up you go. And you see that great vast host as they're suspended in heaven. And all of them gathered around the throne. Every one of them looking to the throne. They're not looking at each other. They're looking at the throne. They're not worried about each other. They're looking at the throne. And they see one high in the jitter. And there the eyes are fixed upon the Son of God. But there's something funny about this throne. Before him a great book sets. And this book contains names. Names that have been written in blood. Names that are read. And they're easy to read. For the one that wrote them, wrote them with a perfect hand. And he wrote the name and he knew how to spell it. And there were no mistakes ever made. No problem with ever having to erase it and make it over again. When he wrote that name and that book in blood, it stayed there. And there the book lies in front of him. Stand aside, would you please? Now look at him. That air terrible soul that has been brought up out of the pit with the slime and filth of his self-righteousness hanging from him. Maybe his form has been altered just a little bit with his short stay in hell. For well, my friend, my Savior became a worm for me, didn't he? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man. And Jesus Christ said, You are of your father the devil. Well, the devil has three forms, doesn't he? And he's the great red dragon right now. And we know that. And we know that if you're of your father the devil, and I bear the image of my father, my father is Jesus Christ, God the Father, then they'll bear the image of their father. And so you start to change. You don't look like you did when you went to hell. But you still have your memory. Step aside, please. Let him through. And you walk up before the judge on that day. And the light's so bright you can't stand it. Cover your face. What are you standing on? You look around and nothing under you. He's holding you up. And you stand before him. And he opens the book. And he comes to the letter of your name. And I don't know what your name is spelled by, but say it's K. He comes to the K. He puts his finger on the book. 
and he runs it down. And he comes to where your name should be recorded. And it's not there. And then he looks you square in the eye. And as you stand there, he says, speak. And with a hand pointed at you, you'll have your day in court. You've been in hell. Maybe you've learned how to take your peace. Maybe you've learned enough in the lawyer room of hell to become a great advocate when you stand before God to take your peace. You say, I'm a big man. I know what I can do and what I can't do. I'll worry about it later. I'll take care of myself. You'll have the day. And then the book is opened and your chance is there in silence. All through heaven there's silence. God gives that soul the opportunity take his part speak and now it's your turn well God what about the heathen it is written what about the Jew it is written what about those that never heard it is written what about the hypocrites in the church it is written and after you have exhausted every excuse you have you've said everything you can think to say then he points at you and says see these nail prints in my hand See this in my side. See these prints in my feet. They're for you. Look at the blood. Look at the blood-washed throne. And you look around you. And you look at the faces of people who love God and are saved. And he says to you, you could have been one of them. And you notice a familiar face standing there. One you knew in the world. Mama. I don't know how many mamas pray, prayed for their son to be saved. Mama. Oh, you know what mama looks like? But she's never been as pretty. And mama was a lot older than that last time you saw her. And you say, Mama, is that you? And you know it's her. And maybe she reaches her hand out to you. Mama, my God, can anything be done? I've suffered so long. Oh, Mama, if you only knew where hell, where I've been, hell is terrible, Mama. Oh, please, say a good word for me. I'm sorry, son, nothing can be said. Oh, Mama, please, I'm sorry. You've had your day in court. He raises his hand and he points. Now listen, it's quiet, no singing. No rejoicing. It's quiet. Right now, it's not quiet in heaven. Then it will be. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Oh, the sound rings in your ears. For the first time in your life, you know that judgment is forever now. Maybe you entertained a slight hope when you came out of hell. Maybe when you knew you weren't burning like you had been before. Maybe God gave you a reprieve. Maybe God gave you a second chance. And you were hoping that this day, oh, when I get there, oh, maybe God is just going to give me a little place back there somewhere. Oh, when he puts his hand in front of you and he said, depart strikes home to your soul, there is no second chance. That hell was just where God kept you until he put you in this terrible place. What place, preacher? They come and get you. One on one arm, and one on the other. And you look at your mama and God, and they take hold of you, and they drag you away. And you scream. You scream. Oh, no! No! And away you go. But that's not it. That's not what it's for. You hear it behind you. Yes, you hear it. What do you hear? You hear the roaring. You remember that sound because that's what hell sounded like. The roaring of a fire. This one's louder. How could it be louder, preacher? It's bigger. You hear the sound of the roar. And it's behind you. And you know where you're going now. 
Oh, you fight and you plead and you beg and you reach for mama, but the hand won't let you go. You try to get away, but you can't get away. Where can you go? What can you do? You can't do anything. And the way they drag you, and the last sight you see is that great throne as they all look once again to Jesus sitting upon a throne. And there your mama, maybe her eyes follow you just a little way, and she turns her head back. And she looks at you for the last time, crying. Her tears are rolling off of her cheeks. God has to allow it, I suppose. There has to be a time for your judgment to be complete. For every good deed you ever saw, for every good word you ever heard, and for every time the gospel such touched your soul, there's going to be given account for that. And I suppose that's God's way of doing it. And you know your time is up. And you hear that terrible roar behind you. Oh, the roar. And those angels take you and they toss you into the lake. A lake as far as the eye can see. Boiling, bubbling, spitting fire into the sky. Well, there is no sky. A lake burning with fire and brimstone. And you're tossed bodily into that lake. And you go into the lake and just that fast you're completely covered with the fire and the brimstone. And it burns from your feet to your head and you squeak and you fight and you thrash. And you're in a lake of fire. And the arm comes up and up. And you try to pull yourself up. What for? Just do you no good. And as that hand reaches, gaping for the last time. And it comes down. Down, down, beneath the surface of that lake. And you go into the lake of fire and brimstone to burn forever and ever. And then the last soul to be judged at that judgment and the last scream to be heard. And the Son of God gathers your mama and all the rest of them around that great throne. Come in close, he says. Come in close lifts his hand and he starts at the right hand and crosses every face no more crying but a smile and when it reaches the other side every tear has been wiped away every memory has been gone she doesn't know you anymore she not be tormented with your mind with thinking of you forever she won't even know you ever existed it's gone wiped away you're in hell, and you'll burn forever. Aren't you glad that if you die and you know Jesus, the very moment your soul leaves your body, you hear music, and you see light, and you see loved ones, and as you come fleeing closer to them, you see the joy of heaven, you see the bliss, and peace, and love, and light of the Son of God. Aren't you glad that if you know Jesus Christ, the moment you die to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? Aren't you glad Paul said, I have a desire to be with Him which is far greater, but therefore to remain with you is needful? Aren't you glad, my friend, that if you're saved, you'll be with Jesus forever? But if you're not saved this morning, hell will be your home. Hell will be your home. That hand is gone now. Out he stretches his hand, and it all made new. Whatever he chooses to create his business, all made new. Let's bow your head just a moment. Father, I want you to...